So good evening, and uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, it's, it's really great to see so many of you here who are interested in hydrofracking and the ways in which you can get involved in this debate. So tonight you will have the opportunity to learn more about hydrofracking from our excellent panel of leading environmental experts. In addition, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, and more importantly, after that, you will have the opportunity to make comments about fracking, which I will include with my comments to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to make sure that they are entered into the public record. I decided to have this forum on hydrofracking, um, even though hydrofracking will largely take place outside of New York City, in upstate New York, in the Marcellus and Utica Shale, the impacts will be felt across the state. And I think it's important that we all have a chance to learn about the process and the potential impacts. As I'm sure many of you know, fracking is also known as hydrofracking or hydraulic fracturing. And it is the process by which ga millions of gallons of pressurized water, sand, and an unknown mixture of chemicals are drilled into shale formations deep within the earth to extract natural gas. Now certainly in Albany, we've had a lively discussion about fracking and its potential eff effects. In June, the assembly voted to prohibit the issuance of new gas permits for well drilling involving hydraulic fracturing until June 1st, 2012. Because the safety of this process is in question and the protection of the environment is so crucial, we thought that a moratorium was in order and a more deliberate and unrushed analysis of all the factors involved would be a prudent thing to do. So it passed the assembly. Unfortunately, the state senate did not take up the companion bill. Uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation released its draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement, or SGEIS. This is a document of nearly 1,000 pages regarding the environmental impacts of hydrofracking. And it is based upon this document that people will be asked to make comments. The public comment period on this plan will continue through December 12th, 20, 2011. And you can submit comments here tonight or by email, regular mail, or in person at the New York City hearing. But the draft, SGEIS released in September 2011 takes it as a given that while environmental considerations are important, exploitation of this new natural gas asset will produce significant economic benefits for New York's economy, reduce natural gas costs to state residents and industries, and provide for long-term economic development. On the other side, it's important that everyone weigh in on fracking because the process has the potential to contaminate our drinking water, devastate our environment, poses serious threats to the public's health, and would also have a serious impact on the already fragile housing market. And I'm sure um, our panelists will discuss um, the repercussions of instituting uh, hydrofracking in upstate, uh, in upstate New York. At the end of the day, I think most of us could agree that we are rushing into a potentially dangerous situation. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has yet to release the, the results of its study into fracking. Unless and until the EPA does, I don't think it's prudent that we in this state should continue on this crash course. What is the rush? I want to thank all of you for coming out and give a special thanks to our great panelists, Eric Goldstein, Al Appleton, and Deborah Goldberg, and thank them for being with us tonight. And I also want to thank uh, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, in particular, Hannah Kamins, who had to leave um, but who was instrumental in getting all of this together, as well as the rabbis, Madelon, Saul, and Bronstein. I'm truly lucky that... Uh, I'm truly lucky that B'nai Jeshurun is part of this community, 
is always committed toward working toward social justice, and I'm so grateful for the partnership we have on this and on so many other important events. And I didn't forget, later on in the evening, we will have a special appearance by Mark Ruffalo, and he will say a few words about fracking and the importance of making it out to the upcoming New York City DEC hearing. As I'm sure you know, there are tables lined up uh, along the sides of the rooms with literature from environmental groups, including environmental advocates and frac action. So please make sure to take a look and grab some. So let's get started with our panelists. And the first person who will be speaking is Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'll read you his short bio, but I must say that, uh, you don't want me to? Um, Eric Goldstein and I got, uh, got acquainted and, and we're working together. 10 years ago we started uh, when I was working on 9-11 issues and he from NRDC was one of the few environmental groups that actually participated in revealing that the dust and the air were actually not safe. And for that, I will always, always be grateful that you guys stood up and spoke the truth. Fracking is the most visible and most contentious environmental issue to come along in New York State in many, many years. And I think by the end of this evening, you'll get a really clear sense of why that's true. But the fact that so many of you have turned out tonight to attend this session uh, convinces me that you probably already know a fair amount about the topic. Uh, our terrific hostess, Assemblyman Rosenthal, who's, by the way, on all issues dealing with the environment and other causes that we all care about, has just been a terrific, terrific friend of all of ours, and I'm proud to say she's my assemblywoman, uh, has asked me in 10 minutes to describe fracking, to tell you why all of the reasons we're concerned about it, and to talk about what's being proposed in New York. Uh, thanks very much, assemblywoman. Uh, what, I, what I will try to do is uh, use the visual aids, which I must admit I'm not an expert at, to assist me in this task. I feel a little like Oprah now. Uh, all of you will get a small sampling, a little jar of hazardous fracking fluids on the way out. Okay. On the left, uh, we see the traditional or conventional gas drilling activity. Stick a straw straight down, suck up the natural gas. On the right, we see an extremely simplified version of what's called unconventional gas drilling. Uh, that has both the uh, traditional uh, vertical well and then a horizontal well going out. And this horizontal drilling, which is uh, horizontal, uh, can go out for as far as a mile or more. And what, as uh, the assemblywoman indicated, between two and eight million gallons of water, sand, and about 2% of undisclosed chemicals, 322 of them identified in the environmental impact statement, are forced down about a, a mile or so down under the Earth's surface under intense pressure. They cause minor explosions, triggering a, a fissures, additional fissures in the shale uh, which release the small pockets of gas which then uh, travel back up to the surface because of lower pressure there. So, uh, there are a whole host of problems associated with this, but now, because all of the easy to reach gas has been extracted, the reason this uh, issue has come up now is due to these technological advances, uh, which of course bring technological challenges, uh, this horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing is the dominant method of uh, extracting gas uh, in the United States. This is uh, the Marcellus Shale. The Marcellus Shale is the formation uh, about a mile or so below the Earth's surface, stretching from West Virginia all the way up through much of southern New York, uh, in which uh, the natural gas that folks are talking about in New York is trapped. So. It's, it's that uh, brownish area in the southern portion of the New, New York State to the west of the Hudson and the south of the New York State Thruway, more or less, um, where 
gas is located in this Marcellus Shale. It's all or parts of 30 counties in New York, so it's quite a stretch of land. This is the New York City watershed. New York City gets its water from 19 upstate reservoirs. There are six giant reservoirs west of the Hudson River, and here they are. The green lands in this uh, depiction are the Catskill and Delaware watersheds. Only about one or two percent of the water that ends up in a reservoir comes from direct rainfall into the reservoir. The rest drains from the surrounding hillsides uh, and into rivers, streams, whatever, and that flows into the reservoir. So this area is critical for the drinking water supply of half the city's uh, half the state's population. All of New York City and uh, Westchester County, a million people in Westchester as well. This system is also an unfiltered supply. We could spend the whole evening talking about this. We're pleased to have with us former DEP Commissioner Al Appleton, who more than any other DEP commissioner is responsible pres for preserving this system in its unfiltered state, which makes for cleaner water and saves us the costs estimated at $10 billion or more of filtering this supply. This is an exceptionally vulnerable water supply in New York State, and for that reason, is one of the areas that calls, uh, calls for the highest levels of protection. Uh, one particular threat that I'll skip ahead to now because we're on this slide and I've only got eight more minutes, is the threat to the tunnels connecting our reservoirs. So while in the existing New York State proposal, the actual watershed itself is off limits to gas wells and fracking on the surface, uh, there, is, there are several continuing threats. I'll, I'll mention just two of them today. Uh, one threat is to this West Delaware Tunnel and East Delaware Tunnel, which as you see, connect two giant reservoirs with further downstream reservoirs, uh, the Rondout Reservoir, which ultimately flows into uh, Westchester County and then into our drinking water supply here in New York. Those tunnels are 50 years or so old. Um, they weren't built to withstand shocks. They weren't built to keep pollutants out, but to keep water traveling in them. And so all of the water from the Papacton Reservoir and the Cannonville Reservoir travels through those tunnels. The New York City Department of Environmental Protection has wisely recommended that if there is any drilling upstate, that there be a seven mile buffer around those tunnels to protect against vibrations and to protect against intrusion of uh, fracking fluids or other contaminants associated with gas drilling. As things currently stand, uh, there is a buffer of a thousand feet and even that is not really a buffer. If you want more details, check our website. So that's risk number one. There's a similar problem with respect to the dams. Now, in, in, uh, this seems self-evident, but some of these dams are on the edge of the watershed boundaries as such. And many of them are being rebuilt. Uh, some of them are quite old. The Ashokan is uh, one of the first, built around 1917. And so the concept that you could have drilling activities, which uh, many of you have seen in the press recently, in some instances, drilling has now been linked with some small earthquakes. Not big earthquakes, just small earthquakes. But one thing you could be sure of is you don't want even small earthquakes near old dams. So uh, that's another uh, element of the existing program that certainly has caused great alarm. Uh, let me move on with our story. So here's another uh, image of what fracturing is all about. Uh, you could see on the left a column 7,000 feet. That's a, a typical horizontal drill. Again, goes down about a mile and then out, let's say, a mile. Uh, one of the concerns that a lot of people, including the DEP itself, have is that escaping gas can travel through those fissures up into, in the case of other systems, well, in the case of aquifers, in the case of uh, New York City DEP, uh, into or surrounding those tunnels that are about 700 feet on average uh, below the Earth's surface. And so uh, what we're trying to do, if we're drilling, is 
causing explosions that release gas in these fissures, uh, one of the major concerns is that what could come down can also go up and these fissures travel all around. One of the risks uh, that we may talk about a little further. Okay, so what's at risk? Here's a short list. Water quality, water quantity, air quality, land and habitat, public health. Uh, I've got more on my other list here. Truck traffic, noise, industrialization of the landscape, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can hit a couple of those. So, depending upon which documents you read, uh, each time you frack a well, and wells can be fracked multiple times, you can use between two and five, two and eight, this environmental impact statement says, two and eight million gallons of fresh water are needed. And New York has an abundant supply of water, but there's no need to waste it uh, by uh, widespread drilling uh, if there are other ways of getting the water. Among the many, many problems with this proposal in its current form uh, is that it is unclear on requirements for where the water would come from. It doesn't require that the water be recycled. And some portions of the state have more water and some have less. And we know one thing about climate change, it's going to turn things topsy-turvy. These uh, drilling wells, if they're established, will be around 30 years, maybe longer. And uh, there'll be more storms, more severe storms, uh, more water in some places, less water in other places, more evaporation in most places. Uh, and so even though New York State is blessed in that we have an abundant supply of water quality, we need to be sensitive to it, and widespread drilling would require a lot of water. Second uh, problem we talk about is the intrusion of methane and other chemicals from water into aquifers, wells, public water supplies. Uh, there are many examples uh, that one could pick. Uh, for those of you looking for an advanced course, go to the ProPublica website, uh, click on gas drilling, and you'll see about 160 articles that have been written over the last three years. ProPublica is an independent uh, journalistic enterprise. They've done a terrific job reporting on all of the horrors around the country with respect to the business as usual drilling that's been taking place. Uh, a whole variety of chemicals, as we indicated, are contained. Uh, if we had more time, we'd talk about uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials, arsenic and mer mercury, of course. Methane, I don't know how many folks here have seen that movie Gasland, a terrific movie, a lot of fun, entertaining. And you see, uh, folks can actually light the methane uh, with a match in their faucet in the kitchen where methane gas has escaped from gas drilling activities and invaded their uh, home territory. Now, the gas drillers will tell you that there's no connection between the gas drilling that's taking place right nearby and the fact that all of a sudden they can light their uh, tap water with methane, but we'll let you be the judge of that. This is a pretty sophisticated crowd on the Upper West Side. Okay, uh, so here's just another example. This, this was a great picture when I took it with my little baby camera. Okay, uh, this gives you some sense of the scale of a drilling pad, a drilling operation, even for a single drill. It could be five to eight acres. Uh, that nice little uh, swimming pool on the bottom left of your photograph <coughs> is a retention pond where uh, depending upon what was in it. I'm not familiar with what is in this one. It could either be the fracking fluids, it could be the mixture that's prepared to go down. Uh, this is not a good way of storing potentially hazardous materials. Uh, again, in a drilling program, even if you were attempting to do one, you need to have ways of dealing with the hazardous waste. One of the problems with the New York State program is it doesn't call the hazardous waste from a drilling operation hazardous. And uh, that's a continuing theme throughout the national movement on fracking. Exemptions from the law at the federal level here in New York, big problems with what you do with the wastewater. Uh, as much as 40% of those millions of gallons that are injected into every well come back up. How do you dispose of it? You don't want to send it to a sewage treatment plant. They're not equipped to treat it. Uh, you don't want to leave it in one of these pits or impoundments. Anytime there's a storm, they're vulnerable to be overflowing. And there are a host of other problems associated with that. 
probably the best of a series of bad choices is to build a facility specifically equipped to treat those wastes uh, before they're discharged into some surrounding waterway. But that's a very risky proposition, and the state is not even requiring that at this point. Uh, okay, here's some more Wyoming water pollution. Uh, Wyoming and Texas, for better or worse, are some of our best cases, along with Pennsylvania, for the problems associated with fracking because they've gotten started right away and over the last decade they've had a whole host of problems. So this is one of my favorite examples, Dunker Creek, which is about 14 miles on the border of Pennsylvania and West Virginia, which all of a sudden was wiped out as a result of a fracking-related accident. Uh, the two people in this picture, hard to see on this, uh, are standing in the middle of the creek which had to be drained so they could remove all the dead fish. Everything died in this example. Uh, okay, then there's air quality. There are hundreds and hundreds of truck trips that are required to bring materials in and take gas out uh, and transport. This is a big industrial operation. Uh, Wyoming, which has historically had some of the cleanest air in the country, now finds that in areas that are being fracked, it's violating national health standards for ozone. So the air in Wyoming now is worse than the air in Los Angeles in areas where they're doing some fracking. Again, illustrating the potential risks from this, particularly when it's done with a poor regulatory scheme. This gives you a sense of what it looks like. These are the compressors on a fracking site uh, to build up all the pressure to get uh, the water and sand and chemicals injected uh, in order to cause the fracking operation to occur is a big activity. Okay, then there are changes to uh, the land and habitat, fragmentation of well sites. Uh, there's a great picture that I didn't include in here which shows how these well pads, even spaced out on various places, can cho totally change the nature and the character of the rural areas in which they're sited. Much more we could say about that, but not in a 10-minute presentation. Other impacts, noise, visual impacts, community character, cumulative impacts. All of these are things that have not fully been assessed in the environmental impact statement. Uh, there's one other um, impact that I want to talk about for a second. And um, that is the socioeconomic impacts that occur. There's been a lot of talk about jobs and the jobs that would be uh, created by uh, fracking industry. But let me say something about jobs. Not all jobs are created equal. And uh, the, many of the jobs, as the EIS itself indicates, uh, would initially go to folks from uh, out of state who are experienced in doing this fracking drilling. They're not going to get some you know, unemployed young kid uh, who lives up uh, in Chemung County and put him to work in this drilling equipment. And so at least initially, even the promise of jobs, which is attractive, we all recognize the need for jobs, we're not going to poo-poo that. Uh, but the EIS fails to take a look at who would get those jobs and more importantly, what other jobs would be affected and how the existing uh, agricultural jobs, tourism jobs, all of the other industries that we're hoping to build up in the Catskills in particular, but throughout New York State, uh, would be affected adversely uh, and what those impacts would be. In addition to what the impacts would be in terms of increased uh, police protection, in impacts on housing, impacts on schools. There are a lot of costs to a big industrialization program like this. And again, so far, the environmental impact statement hasn't uh, examined them in any great detail. I, I, I'm going to defer uh, other comments to, our pres to the question and answer because we have two more. We'd love to hear from all of you. I'll, I'll just end on uh, three quick notes. First, it's uh, fantastic that all of you have come out here tonight. I've been to many, many community meetings, and uh, it's been a long time since I've seen this many people. Uh, it's critical that all of you come to the hearings that are upcoming. This is great, but you've got to speak out because the governor, who has historically been a friend of the environment, is going to be listening. And final decisions have not yet been made. And without sounding too corny, we can really make a difference. If people in this size come out and speak out, 
we can change very significantly this proposal. And so there is a New York City hearing on November 30th. I'm sure that the Assemblywoman will send you information uh, on those details. Uh, you've all signed up. Hopefully we have all of your email addresses. There are also three other upstate hearings. And if any of you happen to have second homes or some connection with any of those communities, it would be even more important. We know at the New York City hearing, people are going to come out and say, protect our drinking water. But upstate, where there are some conflicting pressures and some contentious debates, those of you who have some connections upstate, it would be great for you to come to those hearings, or one of them if you can. We'll try to get you the specific information. That was the one thing I said this morning. Let me bring the information on the hearings, and of course, I, I left that home. Okay, uh, two last points. Assemblywoman Rosenthal has been a great friend of the environment all the way through, and even with the activity that's going on in these state hearings, and it's a proposed state permit that needs to, program that needs to be issued, proposed regulations that would govern the whole fracking program, and there's an environmental impact statement, and we're in the middle of the environmental review process now. There's important legislative work that can be done, and so uh, don't forget to support Assemblyman Rosenthal when she is informing you about potential legislation that she introduces or that she's co-sponsoring, because even if we can't get everything through the executive branch in this process, uh, the legislature is a very important place to get things done and protect our air, our water, and our land. And I encourage you to read the newsletters and follow through on that. And then finally, look, there's a lot of things, America is, we're very ingenious. There's a lot of things that we can do to protect our water and to make sure that we have clean water. <laughs> but we know that the best thing we could do is to seek to prevent pollution in the first place rather than trying to clean it up at the end of the line. And right now, we're at a point where we can still prevent this pollution. It hasn't happened yet. The proposal that is currently on the table is a better proposal than the fatally flawed Patterson draft. So we've made some progress, but there's a long, long way to go. And I know that if everyone in this room participates, we'll be able to make a difference. Thank you very much.